It is the last step of the race that counts the most. Sometimes we think it's how we start, and that's a part of it, and so long as we start, but really it's the last step that makes all the difference. If you run each step of the race, but not the last one crossing the finish line, then the end result is the same as if you never took any steps at all. It's easy to make commitments at the beginning of the journey. Very easy to make commitments at the beginning. But what happens when problems arise or unexpected life-changing issues occur? What do we do at that point? And I think sometimes we overestimate commitment and then we underestimate perseverance. We're going to learn the benefits of perseverance and how to find strength in the area of perseverance so that we can persevere through what seems impossible. As an up-and-coming actor, many find it hard to persevere through the difficult times of, of the beginnings. And there's a story of a young man, an up-and-coming actor, who had dreams of making it big. And when he started his career, career, it seemed he couldn't get any steady work. He tried and tried different commercials and and tried to act in, in uh, different plays. He auditioned for various uh, opportunities and various jobs, but was turned down a lot. Didn't even make the, uh, the, the role for their college play, so he was turned down a lot. Well, he finally got his big break in the 80s, and he, he started to uh, act in a TV sitcom, and was getting paid only $5,000 a week. Now, you may think, only? I wish I got paid $5,000 a week. But compared to what he's making today, that's all he was getting paid back then. But it also allowed him to guest star in different shows and, and be on, uh, appear on different uh, talk shows. And, and so it gave him more exposure. And he continued to move forward. And then he got his biggest break. All of that led to his biggest break where he acted in the starring role of a feature film. So that kicked him off. And what made the difference of this actor was the word perseverance. That's what made the difference. He never let rejection dissuade him from moving forward. He didn't let what other people said uh, pull him down. He didn't let the things that came against him rob him of his dream. He kept moving forward and and when he had jobs that were offered to him that were mediocre or wasn't to par, he just felt this will help me to continue to move forward. Well, now, over 30 years later, he is one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood. In 1995, he received six, this movie that he uh, acted in, which was the most successful movie in 1995, received six Academy Awards, including Best Picture. The movie... Forrest Gump, the actor, Tom Hanks. In an interview, he was asked, what would you say to young and upcoming uh, actors? Because, you know, Tom, you, you own two Oscars, and you have another 65 wins and 62 nominations of various awards. What would you say to young up-and-coming actors who want to make it in this business? And this is what Tom Hanks says. He says, it's, it's a harsh business because you will be judged not by the people you give orders to, but by the people who have given you orders. If you don't deliver and get it done, it'll be counted against you. You can't take anything personal because it'll take a while for you to develop. 99% of the time in this business, people will say, no, thank you. You don't got what it takes. You don't have the talent. And they'll turn you down. That means out of 100 people you're asking, 99 will say, no thanks. He says, you, you, regardless of being turned down, regardless of not getting the job, you got to say to yourself, I'm going to go out there and do this again tomorrow. 
And he says this, you have got to know who you are, what your set of skills are, that I'm in this for the long haul. And he says this, it all comes down to perseverance. Now today, if you think about it, Tom Hanks being one of the highest paid actors in the business, gets paid over $20 million a movie that he does compared to what he was making back then. And it doesn't come down to talent. It doesn't come down to necessarily your skill, but it all comes down to perseverance. It's not your destiny. It's perseverance. Everybody, everybody has a purpose, but not everybody can reach it unless we persevere. So what we're going to do is learn from the perseverance of God's people, the Israelites, and through their desert years, as well as Jesus Christ, because he went through some struggles too, and the benefits of persevering. If there's anyone or any group of people we can learn from, it should be people in the Bible, because they persevered, they went through many obstacles, but they did it with the strength of God. And we want to learn how we can benefit from perseverance. Did you know that there are benef benefits from persevering? There are many benefits, and that's what we want to learn today. So you can take out your notes. They're in your, your bulletin, and, and uh, you can follow along. But I'll be in Deuteronomy chapter 2. Now, I've said this uh, in the beginning of the year, but uh, what we're doing on our Sunday mornings, because this is our year of focus, is we're going through our devotions together. Uh, if you're reading the bookmark and you're doing your devotions, then you're going to find what we talk about on Sunday morning uh, is the week of us doing devotions together. And if you don't know what devotions are, that means we just read the, we read the Bible, we journal, we write down what the Lord is teaching us, and we use a little acrostic, S-O-A-P, our scripture, our observation, our application, and then our prayer. And then we just listen to God. Let Him speak to us. Sometimes we speak to God, but we don't give him the opportunity to speak to us. And that's what the Word of God does. So get into the Word. Go pick up a bookmarker, or you can go online, and we have our devotions section, and it'll help you to follow along. But in Deuteronomy chapter 2, this is the Israelites, and they've gone through their years of slavery with Egypt. They've been rescued by God. He, he brought them through the wilderness, and now they're in the wilderness, actually uh, continually becoming their own nation. And God is giving them his laws, the instruction on how you're to live, that you're not supposed to live like the other nations. He already uh, showed them the promised land. They did some uh, spy work. You know, remember Joshua and Caleb and the rest, they went out and, and uh, spied out the land. So now they're in this desert. And they're now at this season of persevering through the desert so that they can get to the promised land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 2, it says, Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted Mount Seir for many days. And the Lord spoke to me, saying, You have skirted this mountain long enough. Turn northward and command the people, saying, You are about to pass the territory of your brethren, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Do not meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall buy food from them with money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hand, he knows you're trudging through this great wilderness. So it's like he's saying, God knows the difficult season you're going through. These 40 years, the Lord, your God, has been with you. You have lacked nothing. And then he continues in verse 13. Now rise and cross over the valley of the Zered. So we crossed over the valley of the, of the Zered, and the time we took to come from Kadesh, uh, Kadesh Barnea until we crossed over the valley of the Zered was 38 years. That's how long it took them, 38 years, until all the generation of the men of war was consumed from the midst of the camp, just as the Lord had sworn to them. 
In verse 16, so it was when all the men of war had, finished, uh, had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me saying, this day you are to cross over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near the people of Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them. Again, he's saying, don't become like these other nations. For I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. In verse 24, rise, take your journey, and cross over the river Arnon. And he says this, look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Now here God is telling Moses, this is what needs to take place. This is how you're going to accomplish this. But notice that every step of the way, God is saying, you're going to encounter this battle. This is what's going to happen. You got to go through this valley. And Moses is saying, look, 38 years we've been doing this. In other words, God is saying, here's the promise. Moses, are you guys willing to persevere to receive the promise? See, in order for us to receive a promise, there's something that we need to persevere through. Oh, why doesn't God just hand us promises? Why doesn't he just hand us things? And, and why doesn't he just, you know, just bless us and, and uh, just give to us? Where, why do we have to persevere through something? Why do we have to so-called earn these things? Well, that's what we're going to learn. That there's so much more to perseverance than what we think it is. One thing is for sure, we cannot earn salvation. That's a gift given to us by God. Sometimes we think, well, if I just do good works, then I'll, then I'll gain God's approval. But salvation is a gift that God gives to you and I. It's a free gift. Perseverance is something that we go through in order to receive these promises. You see, every person can receive benefits from perseverance by understanding a couple truths that we're going to go through this morning. And the first one is this, and you can write this in, that perseverance releases the blessings of God that quitting will never bring. That's what perseverance does. It's not talent or destiny. It's perseverance. It releases the blessings of God that quitting will never bring. Perseverance brings many life-changing benefits, life-changing rewards. Perseverance is not an issue of our time or talent. It's an issue of finishing. Everybody can start, and anybody can start, but not everybody finishes. Perse uh, famous coach Vince Lombardi, he says this, the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength or a lack of knowledge. It is a lack of determination. See, perseverance is needed. And we know that life consists of, of, of sprints, different races in, in, in a day or in a life or in a year. That our whole life is, yeah, may, maybe a, a marathon race, but, but it consists of short bursts. Short races that we, gotta, we need to finish every day, whether it would be showing up to work, uh, being there as a parent, uh, speaking life into our children. There are short bursts every single day, short sprints in this marathon of life. When explorer Columbus uh, faced incredible difficulties while sailing west uh, to find a shorter route to the Indies, uh, he, he came across some, some huge obstacles. He came across... Uh, many opportunities to call it quits. And he could have said, nope, not going to do this, we're done. Even though his crews encountered storms, experienced hunger and deprivation, he dealt with extreme discouragement. The crews of the three ships were near mutiny, and Columbus still had to think through if he's going to persevere. Well, the account of the journal that, that he was writing in, and, and uh, he said the same thing day after day, and whatever he journaled, he always wrote this, today we sail on. And I think we're all going to encounter storms. We're all going to encounter a difficult season. We're all going to encounter a, a, a period where perseverance is going to be needed. 
With Columbus, of course, his perseverance paid off, and he may not have found a shorter route, but he did discover more continents. And he made history. See, he sailed because his focus was clear that he was going to win every short race that he encountered. Some of us look at our life and we say, well, I, I can't do this. I don't know how this is going to happen. And, and although we look at the big picture, sometimes the big picture scares us. Whether it's marriage, whether it's a, a relationship setback or, or a financial difficulty uh, or a health issue, sometimes the big picture really scares us because we see everything rather than looking at the short races that we need to finish. If you have a huge project, instead of looking at the big project, look at each short individual race that is required to finish in the long marathon that you have to accomplish, in whatever it may be. It can be in our very own family with our children that maybe they're not doing well in school. Well, what race do you need to win today? Maybe it's just building a relationship with them or encouraging them. Maybe in your marriage, there's, there, are is, there are issues in there that, that it's too big for you to tackle, and, and uh, you're thinking, how are we going to do this? But just take one short race at a time. Just do that sprint. Finish that well. And you'll begin to find that as you persevere through it, that the big picture will take care of itself because you ran every single race well. Regardless of what hurdle you may have fallen over or tripped over, you get back up and you jump over the next little by little. And you'll watch. At the end, you'll see the benefits of persevering. It was at a sales convention that the corporate sales manager got in front of all 2,000 of his salespeople. And then he said this, did the right brothers quit? And everybody said, no, they kept going. Did Charles Lindbergh quit? No, kept going. Did Ray Lewis quit? No, he kept going. Did Thorndike McKeister quit? And everybody said, who? <laughs> Thorndike McKeister, did he quit? Thorndike McQueester, we never heard of this man. He goes, exactly, because he quit. <laughs> See, I, 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 don't, I don't think any of us want to play it to quit. We all play to win. We don't play to quit. Nobody starts a game to quit. Every single one of us are given opportunities to start. Everyone makes a commitment at the beginning, but very few make that last step to finish the race. Now, how many highly successful people do you know that have quit? I don't think any of us know. Why? Because they quit. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 8 through 12, and it's in your notes, the Lord is speaking this, and Moses is, is writing these words down so that he can pass this on to the next generation so that we would understand that, that there are benefits through persevering. And he says, therefore, be careful to obey every command I am giving you today. Every command. You want to circle that word, every command that I'm giving you today so you may have strength to go in and take over the land you're about to enter. If you obey you will enjoy a long life in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors and to you, their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land you are about to enter and take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you planted your seed and made irrigation ditches with your foot as in a vegetable garden. Rather, the land you will soon take over is a land of hills and valleys and, and plenty of rain, a land that the Lord your God cares for. He watches over it through each season of the year. And what the Lord is speaking to Moses and to us is that he takes care of the promises. He takes care of it. He'll give us strength for it. He watches over the promises. The promises of God don't go away. They're always there. It's if we're going to persevere and encounter it and reach it. See, I, I, I want to be the encourager to you this morning that whatever you may face or whatever you're facing, that you would persevere through it in your marriage, with your children, 
Maybe they're having a difficult time in school or, or with their grades, whatever it would be. Or, or maybe even you at work, maybe you're, you're hitting an obstacle and you don't know how to get through this season. It could be a loss of a loved one. How do you get through this season? I want to encourage you to draw strength from God and persevere because there's, there are benefits from persevering. Too many of us, I think, say, well, it's too hard. It's too hard. It's just so difficult. And we all go through difficulties. We all have those seasons. And God is saying, I know the season you're going through. I understand, but here's the promise. And if you can only see the promise, then you will begin to understand why you persevere and the benefits through persevering. Sometimes we, we say, well, too many, too many people are complaining. And sometimes we say this, I can't persevere. Too many idiots I work with. I just can't. They don't understand what I see. They don't understand what, what I'm saying. They don't see from my point of view. And so we want to call it quits. Sometimes we say, you know what, too much adversity. So I'm done. I'm, I'm just giving up. And then you throw in the towel. I want to encourage you in this. And number two, you can write this in. Perseverance draws valuable less, uh, benefits out of adversity. We don't like adversity, but perseverance draws many benefits out of adversity. We're, we're going to have adversity. We'll, we'll encounter adverse circumstances. It's going to happen. It's a part of life. But it's not adversity that should define us. It's not when we come across a, a, a difficult time. It's really how we respond to adversity that will define us. There are many who give up at the same wall of adversity that others choose to rise up with. You can have two people at the same obstacle, at the same impasse, at the same wall, and, and one may say, well, I have nothing to gain from this. The other person will say, wait a minute, our children are on the other side. we got to get over this wall. While one is thinking of all the reasons why they shouldn't climb this wall or shouldn't persevere through it, the other is thinking how I need to do this. The other is thinking of all the reasons why they should. See, it comes back to, do you believe that you have a purpose? Do you believe that your life here on this earth is for a purpose and a reason, not just for existence sake? Otherwise, if we don't believe we have a purpose, we'll never persevere through whatever comes our way. Well, how do you succeed through it? How do, you, how do you succeed through getting through these walls? Well, it comes back to that word perseverance. It's perseverance. People find the benefit to them personally that comes from any trial that they recognize and they realize that the best thing about adversity is coming out at the other side because that's where the promises lie. It's on the other side. There's valuable, valuable benefits that come out of our troubles and, and finding something good in the process. It's like when we put our children to work and they, they work hard and, you know, they, they grumble and they complain and they say, oh, this is so difficult. But then when they're done and they receive a reward, whether it will be, you know, a financial reward or, or some kind of a reward, then there's, there are benefits to that. We go shopping every once in a while and, and uh, we're shopping... Uh, yesterday, or yeah, it was yesterday, and, and uh, sometimes, and I'm, I'm sure you're like this too, sometimes you just want to be alone at home to just relax. Well, sometimes Heidi likes to go and uh, shop or go buy something or we need something, and sometimes she'll ask me, do you want to come with me? And most of the times I'll say, no, you go, you have fun. But then that's our time together. So this time I said, okay, um, maybe, maybe I'll go. And then she, she says this. She goes, I'll get you an ice cream. I'm like, deal. It's a deal. And she knows that, that that's what it takes for me to go shopping. While she's shopping, I'm eating. I'm having a great time. There are benefits to persevering through what I'm going through when it comes to shopping. I benefit from it. Now, regardless if she buys something or not, I still have a great time. I'm eating. I love my desserts. And I know some of you wives, you do the same thing with your husbands. You go buy them a snack, and they're happy. They're ready to go. I think when we look at perseverance, we just think of the hard work it's going to take rather than the benefits that come out on the other side. And God is saying, my promises are always there. You persevere, and here are my promises. See, giving up when adversity threatens can make a person bitter. 
but persevering through adversity makes one better. I think we want to be better. I think we want our loved ones to be better. I don't think we want to be bitter. Well, here's, here's where it becomes difficult. We must understand there's no shortcuts when it comes to perseverance. We've got to persevere even when there's adversity because there are benefits to persevering when there are adversities. Do the right thing every single day, every day, and you'll find that perseverance will compound over time. There are certain benefits that you will never find if you just call it quits. And then you will find that you will grow daily because that's a benefit of perseverance. You, we grow daily. We learn more. Sometimes we make vows and commitments, but we never think about that time when, when, when it becomes difficult, that we have to persevere through. We don't think that, well, boy, uh, uh, sometime in my marriage, I'm going to hit a roadblock when we get married. We just think, oh, everything's going to be smooth sailing. Or when we encounter a new job or a new responsibility, a new task, everything looks great in the beginning. But we never think about, well, what about that season when it becomes difficult? What about that season when my health becomes an issue? What about that season when I'm not able to like I used to? What about that season when all the kids are grown up and they're gone and it's just me and my spouse? What then? I mean, do we have enough in us in our relationship for our marriage to thrive? I don't, I don't know if we think about those times where we're going to hit the wall. That's where perseverance comes in. One of the disciples of Jesus Christ, specifically Peter, learned that lesson quickly. And in Mark chapter 14, I'll read this story. We find that Peter is faced with some challenges because he made some commitments. And in Mark chapter 14, Peter is, is making some commitments. And if you know the story of Peter, as we read this, you're going to understand that, oh boy, that was a... It was a strong commitment he made, but didn't think about what was going to come up in the future. In Mark chapter 14, verse 27, in the New Testament, it says, Then Jesus said to them, and he's speaking to his disciples, he said, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, listen to Peter's words. This is what he says. Peter said, but even if all are made to stumble, I will not. So Peter said, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter spoke more vehemently, if I have to die with you. I will not deny you. That's Peter's commitment. That's his strong remarks. That's his, that's his strong starting point. And they all said likewise. That's his disciples. They all agreed. They said, yeah, us too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in this. We're in this to the death. Well, they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now, he just said for them to sit. He didn't ask them to do, go do battle, go do anything more than just sit. He said, just sit, and I'm going to pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, now watch this roadblock that Christ encounters. Watch the adverse circumstance that he encounters. He says this, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. Jesus is at a point of his life where he hits a wall. And it's a tough wall because he knows he has to die for our sins. As an innocent man, he's going to die in place of us for our sins to take care of what we could not do on our own. And he says, this is what I'm dealing with right now. He tells his disciples, stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. So Jesus is now praying to God, and he's saying, can this pass? Is it possible? Because I know what's going to take place. Can this pass? And he said, Abba, 
Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. And here's where it takes a shift in gears and where that, that breakthrough takes place. He says, nevertheless, not what I will, but, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Simon Peter, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for, the eyes, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Just a couple of verses earlier, they were in it for the death. We're in this till we die. And he's like, you guys are sleeping. What kind of commitment is that? Are you, are you, are you in this? And they're kind of like, oh, yeah, we can do this. We, we got it. We got it. We got it. They're falling asleep. He comes to them a third time and says to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. I'm sure at that specific point, adrenaline shot into the system of these disciples and said, wait, wait, what a minute? What, what is happening? Well, my betrayer is here, so rise up. Let's go. It's time. And I'm sure at that very given moment, the disciples were like, okay, this is, okay, this is real. This is real stuff, guys. We can't just say anymore. This is the time that we start doing. And now the betrayer comes, and we know it's Judas, one of Christ's disciples, betrays him, and now is given into the hands of the officials. Now they're going to take him away. In verse 66 of chapter 14 of the book of Mark, now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warm, warming himself around the fire, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I, I, I neither know or, or understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and, and began to say to those who stood by, this is, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And the second time the rooster crowed, then Peter recalled to his mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Think about it. Peter made this big commitment and said, I'm in it. All of his disciples said, we're in it till death. The moment they're challenged with adversity, they bail. Here's my question. When you make a commitment, have you thought about what you'll do when adversity hits? Because if you don't think about adversity when you make a commitment, you're going to find it very difficult to persevere when it hits. If you're facing something right now, there are huge benefits from persevering through adversity. When you persevere through what seems like an impasse or a roadblock, God says there, there are promises on the other side. And Jesus was teaching his disciples what it meant to persevere. That it wasn't about us. It wasn't about our will, but it was about the will of God, that God saw something bigger than what they could possibly imagine. The Israelites persevered and received the promised land. Jesus persevered, and he died for the sins of the world, reconciling man to God. Tell me that's not a huge benefit from persevering. We received that promise of Jesus persevering. We received that. It, if, if he had not persevered through that difficult season, none of us would be here. We'd be living in a totally different world with no hope at all. But because of Jesus and he persevered, then we receive the valuable benefits from him persevering. 
Many of us have been married for years. I'm sure you're able to draw valuable benefits from persevering through adversity, especially in your marriage. Pass that on to your children. Pass that on to newlyweds, people who are just married, because in the beginning, or even those who are engaged, that they may come to you and say, oh, we're, we're engaged. Well, we're happy for you. Hey, if you ever need help with thinking things through, let me know. Oh, no, 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 we're good. We love each other. Well, love is great. It'll, it, love, you need love in a relationship, but you also will need perseverance. Ask anyone who's been married for over a day. You will need perseverance in this thing called marriage. Some of you are, are maybe uh, going through school or college, and, and you're, you're encountering difficult seasons. There are benefits that come through persevering. Maybe some of you who have already gone through school, you can attest, yes, there are, there are benefits through persevering. Some of you may have gone through a health issue and, and you can give to someone else the valuable benefits from you persevering through that season because there may be some that are just in the beginning of that season and they feel like there's no hope, but you can give that hope because you've persevered through it. See, a, a heroic mark of a person who is able to draw valuable benefits from adversity through perseverance is a, is, a, is a person who is able to say, it's not what I want, God. It's what you want. That's why Jesus said it well, Mark 14, 36. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This is what Jesus teaches us in number three. Make God my source of strength to persevere. That's what Jesus teaches us. He says, you're going to encounter this season. You're going to encounter this desert time. The Israelites understood that, but they drew their strength from God, and Jesus does no different. He says, you need to draw your strength from God because it's not our will that we want done. It's really God's will. There are many people and opportunities that, that will try to kill our purpose in life. There are people that will try to rob us of our purpose in life, but you've got to understand who you are in Jesus, who you are in the Lord, because it's through that where you'll draw strength from. It's, it's your relationship with God. Some of us won't persevere because we're tired, frustrated, fatigued, whatever it would be. But perseverance, perseverance is stopping not when we're tired, fatigued, discouraged. It stops when we finish the race. That's when perseverance is done. See, perseverance is really not needed when you're not tired. That's, you really don't need perseverance when you're not tired. You don't need perseverance when everything is going well. You don't need perseverance when you're healthy. You don't need perseverance when the finances are, are well. You don't need perseverance when your marriage is strong. You don't need perseverance when your family is strong. You and I need perseverance when we're at our weakest, not when we're at our strongest. We don't need perseverance when we're at our strongest because everything's running smooth. We need perseverance when we're at our weakest. That's where we draw strength from God. It's not when we're, when we're healthy. It's when we're sick and injured. It's not needed when you're strong. It's needed when you're at your weakest we were at the, uh, some of you were there yesterday at the um, American Heart Association, the, the Heart Walk, and it was just a beautiful time. The community came out and, and saw many of you there and, and the volunteers, and just a tremendous job with raising funds for uh, the, the cure and the, uh, trying to find uh, better solutions uh, with uh, heart disease or, you know, stroke and, and how we can reduce uh, the deaths uh, with this issue. And, and as we're, we're walking, you know, I, I can walk for a little while, but I like to run. So I started running, and it, I think it was a 5K. Uh, so I guess that's a little more than three miles. I'm not sure the math on that. But uh, as I'm running, I, I, I kind of ran away from where Heidi was, so I tried to find her again. So I had to turn around, come back, and try to look for her. Finally, I found her, and I started walking again. But because you run so much, you start sweating. But once you start walking, then you start cooling down. 
So I started to freeze. You know, I, I, I was coming cold because my, my shirt is wet. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to, I told Heidi, I said, I'm going to run because I, I'm cooling down and there's more to go. And she said, okay, go ahead. So I kept running. And, and by then, it's almost about four miles I've been running because of the, the route, I guess. So I feel this short pain in, one of, in my joint over here. And as I'm running, I'm thinking, oh, come on, old man. Don't let this kick you down now. Come on. No, no, not right now. And so I'm running, and I feel this sharp pain, and I'm thinking, nope, I'm going to persevere through it. Then I'm thinking, well, what if I, you know, pull something or something happens, and then tomorrow morning I can't even get up the steps to speak at church? And so I pray. I said, Lord, I don't know if it's my pride or what I'm speaking about tomorrow, but I'm going to persevere through this. And so I persevered through it. The pain went away. I thought, thank you, Jesus. And so I'm telling Heidi this. I said, oh, man, I, my, you know, somewhere in my joint, it was sore. And, and she says, no, why don't, you know, why don't you just take your joint medicine? There's that conjointin, it's called, and it, it, I guess it does something. And, and uh, I, said, I said, my what? She goes, your joint medicine, the one you take. I said, you can't say that loud here in Hawaii. <laughs> you can't say, take your joint medicine. She goes, why? It's good for you. I said, but do you realize what you're saying? And she goes, oh. I said, yeah. You say that too loud. Go get on person on the side. Hey, but I get joint medicine. You like some joint medicine. Then I said, no, no, no. I'm fine, Heidi. I think I just, maybe something happened. And I, I thought, you know, there's, there's things that we can do, yes, to prevent pain and suffering. But there are times and there are benefits when we persevere through it. There are times where we're going to encounter a difficult season, a painful season. And what are we going to do at that point? Are we going to say, God, I'm done? Or, Lord, there's something you're teaching me. There's something that I can learn. There's a benefit that I'm going to receive from persevering through this. It's not my will, Lord. Let your will be done. And God will give you strength. And he's going to tell you, that here's, here's what I want you to do. That's why he told, the, he told the Israelites, obey every command. God is that detailed. Where he will let us know this is what you need to do to persevere. See, when you're fresh, you're excited, you're, you're vibrant, you don't need perseverance. Because everything is, everything is fun, work is fun, you're joyful. But to successful people, fatigue or discouragement and heartache is not signs to quit. They perceive it as signals to draw their strength from a bigger source and rely on their character and keep moving forward. Perseverance, is, it doesn't demand more than we have, but it does demand all we have. That's why God says, you got to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It's going to require all not more than what we have, but all that we have. And he'll give us the strength needed. See, as soon as we make excuses, we eliminate the determination of perseverance. There's many excuses that we can make. But did you know that it's much easier to move from even failure to success than it does excuses to success? And God says, yeah, you'll have many reasons to call it quit. You, you have tons of reasons to say, I'm done. But enough with the excuses. I'm going to give you strength for even through the failing times, how you can persevere. And yes, perseverance demands a lot, but here's the good news. Everything you give to perseverance is an investment in yourself to live life at its very best. It's an investment in your very own life. This is why we must understand that we have a purpose because with purpose, we persevere. Without purpose, we have no reason to. In the book of Psalm one, uh, excuse me, 36, verses 5 through 9, it says, Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. 
If you want to experience life, it's not doing extreme things or it's not, it's not getting more or obtaining more or, or buying more. It's really drawing from God that He is the fountain of life. Our final scripture, Psalm 43, verse 5. The psalmist is speaking to himself, and sometimes we speak this to ourselves, but watch. Watch how it changes in emotion. It says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? And I think sometimes that's how we feel. But he says this, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. The Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? And I believe we all can persevere and learn the benefits from perseverance because there is a God who goes before us and understands every obstacle that will come our way. There are benefits from perseverance, but that's where it becomes difficult. We must persevere. With God, all things are possible. Amen? You can close your Bibles and put away your notes. Some of you might uh, remember this story. Uh, we, we see this on TV right now. It's called America's Most Wanted. And I think most of you heard about the story, what took place. But John Walsh, who hosts this uh, show where uh, citizens help the authorities in capturing these uh, men and women who have done horrible crimes and there are, they are on the most wanted list. And so many have been captured. You would think that John Walsh was an actor or some kind of journalist or communicator that, that, that they hired to start this show. But John Walsh, who is the host of this show, uh, experienced a tragedy in his life when his son was just six years old. I think it was back in the 80s. And his, his six-year-old son was abducted. And they did a massive search for about 16 days only to find that his son was dead. Well, John Walsh lost 30 pounds, just didn't want to work, had nothing left in him. His house was for foreclosure. But he saw his doctor, and the doctor's name was Ronald Wright. And the doctor said to him, he said, you're thinking of suicide, aren't you, John? And John said, well, what do I have to live for? My son is gone. I have nothing left. Everything has been taken away. I have nothing. And the doctor said, no, your life is not over. You have much to live for. He says, think about what you just accomplished. You've accomplished the greatest search ever made, ever recorded. Why don't you go and do something about it for others? And John said it was at that very moment that I understood that I have a purpose. And I persevered. And today they have caught many who have done horrendous crimes. Part of what John was doing was he was trying to give hope back to people, especially for the children who have to watch our society behave in this way. And he gave hope. There's a, a ministry on Oahu that we've been watching for a while, and it's called Camp Agape. At Camp Agape, you have these children of those who are incarcerated that have to persevere through this season of their life. And many of us have grown up in a family like that where maybe our parents were incarcerated or maybe you were incarcerated and you had to persevere through that. But we've been watching this camp and we've just been seeing God do many wonderful things through Pastor Roy, who is on Oahu with New Hope Oahu. And... Uh, what we wanted to do was bring that camp here because there are many children here who are trying to persevere through this season of their life. And so in May, we're going to be starting our own Camp Agape. And Pastor Charlie is heading that up. And we've been learning and, and growing in that area so that when we bring it here, we can do it well. And the benefits of persevering for these children uh, will be amazing. 
And so what we're going to ask from you as the congregation is that not only do we hear this message, but that we participate in it too, that we will be a part of persevering with these children uh, through this season. And so if the Lord speaks to you today, we're going to receive a special gift offering that will go towards this camp uh, coming up in May. And if the Lord puts it on your heart, then by all means, go ahead and give. Uh, if he doesn't, please pray that these children will be able to persevere. And maybe one day they will see the promises of God, even though right now it doesn't look so well. So we're going to take a look at this video, and then we're going to pray and conclude and receive this special offering. Let's take a look. When I was in the third grade, my dad went to jail for selling drugs. I didn't know where to turn to. I, I was just so astonished that something like this could happen to me. Like, you hear it all the time, but you never think it would be you. Most of these kids come from a background of very low poverty-stricken environments. Many of the caregivers uh, or the relatives that they stay with have difficulty financially to begin with and so these children are really almost next to wards of the state so to speak so they really come from dire straits and usually broken homes as well. The whole point for Camp Agape is to love on the children whose parents are incarcerated and to get them to know and know that there's a a love that Jesus has for them and that's what we shower upon them love trust teach them about forgiveness and on the last day that they leave it's about hope for a better future one of the most important things about this camp are the times that the kids will spend doing their devotions which is reading the Bible and then journaling about what they read and what it means to them personally you could say it's the backbone of the camp and Roy feels very strongly that if you teach the children how to feed themselves spiritually the impact of this camp will last far beyond this weekend so teach me how to My scripture was Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Mm -hmm. This means to me that why should God forgive our sins if we do not forgive other sins? We have to love our neighbor as we do ourselves because if God loves them, we love them. No matter how much they have hurt us, we have to kill them with kindness and that's for Jesus. My application was, I want to forgive everyone who hurts me starting now. I know it's hard to forgive people like my dad, but I will because that's what Jesus would do. Yeah. And then her prayer. I'm sorry for all my sins, Lord. I will start today and end with you. And thank you for my blessings and all the people I've had in my life. Amen. And then the observation was, we need to forgive the people who sin against us. If we don't, God won't forgive us. Amen. Okay, so then my application is, I need to forgive my mom and family who sinned against me. And then my prayer was, Dear God, please help me forgive my mom and family because I never forgive them yet. Thanks for Camp Agape this year. Thanks for this day and everything you do for us. Amen. Amen. Give her love, family. Give Sabrina love. See, I believe with perseverance, there are benefits to it. And these children, and many that will be here, will be able to receive the benefits of persevering. And you and I can too. And we're going to pray and conclude, and we're also going to pray over this special offering. So if you would bow your heads with me, We'll, we'll, we'll pray together. Lord, we pray for these children and, and even for those that will be a part of Camp Agape coming up in May. We know that life consists of these short sprints that we need to finish in order to finish this marathon race of life. And so we ask for your blessing over the offering that the hearts that are giving, that you would bless them and 
and take the gifts that will further your kingdom with these children. Lord, we pray for just this season that we're going through. Maybe some of us are against a wall right now, and we don't know how to persevere through it. Maybe we're, we're midway through it. Maybe we have never encountered it yet, but we see one coming up. Whatever season we're in, Lord, you have spoken to us in such a way that we can receive from you. So, Lord, our response today is that we would be people who draw strength from you, that we understand there are benefits through persevering, especially when there's adversity. And we know that you will be our source because you are the fountain of life. How many of you this morning, in response, you would say, I want to be a person who perseveres. Would you just raise your hand real quick just to say to God, I receive your word this morning. And we do, Lord. You can put your hands down. So, Lord, we thank you for showing us how to persevere. For without you persevering and showing us that it's not our will, but it's God's will, that we too can persevere even when times seem impossible. We thank you in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen.